Conversations with Tyler is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, bridging the gap between academic ideas and real-world problems. Learn more at mercatus.org. And for more conversations, including videos, transcripts, and upcoming dates, visit conversationswithtyler.com. Hello, I'm here today with Dave Barry, and we're going to talk about humor, Dave's life, and Dave's career. Uh, My first question about humor has to do with YouTube. So a lot of the funny things you have written, rather than doing stand-up, and now there's YouTube as a kind of competitor to written humor. Uh, How has that changed what readers are looking for, and what new constraints does that put on you? Well, the second part is easy. None for me. I, I've, I'm too old to change. I basically do what I've always done. I, I do think um, YouTube and the internet in general have uh, radically changed the humor industry, uh, especially for younger audiences, which are much more oriented towards meme things that they see. Other people look at shorter things, shorter bits, things that require a lot of inside knowledge, which everybody seems to have now, thanks to the internet. Um, and I mean, if I can extend it to not just YouTube, but Twitter and, and Instagram and, and Facebook and, you know, everything happens so fast and everything, you know, builds on everything else so quickly and things become old almost instantaneously or become mutated so much. It's really hard to keep up, which is why I don't really try that hard, to be honest. If I think of the humor I consume, I've realized today compared to when I was a kid, how much of it is from amateurs. So there's some one-star reviews on Amazon that are actually hilarious. Twitter can be funny. It's very context dependent. Maybe you know this South Korean video of Robert Kelly, the man doing an interview. He's trying very hard not to be funny, and his two children barge into the room, oh, oh and they're God. removed yeah. by his wife. Truly, if you were to hire professional writers to write a scene and, try, and professional actors to, to act in it, you could not possibly have outdone that particular 30-second sequence. I mean, it was just so wonderful because it was real. And because he's trying not to exactly. be funny. <laughs> But if there are billions of people out there and say each one is, you know, really funny once in their in their lifetime, and some of that gets captured on YouTube, and you have aggregators or filters, as a professional comedian, you're competing against the funniest moment of each amateur, often unintentional. So do you think it's the case that professionals now, they become more like brands? So if I watch Stephen uh, uh, Colbert report, to me, it's funny. He's not as funny as that moment by Kelly. So he almost, to me, is a kind of watchman, or he reassures me. And that's made the comedian somewhat, in a sense, deliberately not that funny. They play a different role. Or how do you see that? I don't know. I just think that the, you know, the real comedians, like Colbert, you know, he's basically delivering jokes written by a staff of writers and curating whatever they got from the internet you know, or presenting whatever they curated from the internet. Uh, but, you know, guys like Louis C.K. and David Chappelle are still creating their own humor and it's still really funny. It's, you know, and and it's them, it's not anybody else. It doesn't look like anybody else. So yeah, there's way, way more of it out there. Uh, And it's probably, it's probably tougher to be really original, to sound really original than it used to be. Um, But I think there's, you know, there's an awful lot of consumers as well. And, and there just seems to be this huge appetite for more funny, uh, so I don't know that it's worse for, I, and in some ways it may be easier. Like if you are a, a, a kid who wants to get, you know, known as, as a comedian, you don't really have to anymore go the, you know, incredibly difficult route that most of the stand-up comedians I know went, which is, you know, starting out at Catch a Rising Star or someplace much worse than that. And, you know, and doing all those stand-ups in front of, you know, three drunks and slowly getting noticed and finally getting hired by somebody, you can just go on the internet, make a funny video, and sometimes that will produce fantastic results for you. Um, Is the half-life of a joke much shorter now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, everything, I, as I say, I cannot keep up. Personally, I don't even try to keep up. I, I, you know, I see something that everybody tells me is funny. I look at it. But um, to try to stay on top of all the stuff that's coming out, you can't do it. But does it mean we end up in a world where, in a sense, humor is rarely intentional? And it's the moments that weren't expected to be captured. That's what we laugh at. 
and humor is a kind of science that will dwindle or? No. I mean, but that is still going to be, uh, yes, that's part of it. But, but there's still, as I said, there's still a lot of people who are very creative and are going to continue to be funny. They're just going to use whatever is going on around them. And it may be a lot more internet oriented than it used to be. Um, but, you know, in the end, I don't think people's sense of humor has changed that much. It's sort of more the way it gets fed to us now. And say 20 years from now, do you think there will be more professional comedians in this country or fewer? <laughs> I don't know. I do not represent the Humor Bureau. <laughs> so I have no earthly idea. I do, I do think that, like in the particular field that I'm in, which is writing, you know, with like the archaic form of actually writing words down. Right. Uh, it's certainly changed. You know, the, the, the day of the newspaper humor columnist, which is what I was, is pretty much over. Because the newspaper's over. The newspapers, newspapers right. are over. That There's no more audience for it. That People have no more time for it. Uh, so longer form humor does seem to be disappearing. On the other hand, there's a million good TV shows. I think more than there ever used to be funny TV shows. They keep popping up. They're in all the, you know, they're on Amazon. They're in Netflix. Some of them are really pretty fun. I can't keep up with them all. But I'm always surprised at the quality uh, so there seems to be, you know, more outlets maybe than used to be if for not the kind of humor that I did, but, but still it's written humor. It's scripted humor. If we think of the political content of humor. So I think back, say to the 1960s, there's Lenny Bruce, there's Richard Pryor. What's funny at that time, it seems mostly to be anti-establishment in some way or left wing. Uh, John Stewart today, again, Colbert. Uh, there's some conservative or libertarian comedians. There's P.J. O'Rourke. There's yourself. There's Drew Carey. But do you think that the medium of humor today has a slant politically one way or the other? And what is that slant? Oh, definitely. I mean, it is a leftist slant. But, it, but and why? Be, well, because that's what the, the cool kids think they're, you know, every, all the other cool kids are doing. It's kind of funny because it's not very uh, subversive anymore. It's, I mean, what could, what could be less subversive than the, than the humor industry during the eight years of Barack Obama, where like we never made fun of Barack Obama? Correct. Yeah. It was the president of the United States. <laughs> and there were some fun. He got a Nobel Prize for doing absolutely nothing. But, you know, you just didn't, nobody made fun of him as so they continued pounding on, um, you know, I'll never forget, it was, uh, I'll never forget, and here I will be unable to, to summon up the details, but it was one of the many White House Press Association dinners while Barack Obama was president. And he's there, and Donald Trump's there. And I can't remember who the comedian was, but he spent the whole time ripping Donald Trump, who was, at the time, you know, some schmo in the audience. He wasn't the president sitting right next to him. And it, to me, it kind of epitomized the way it is. Like, we're allowed to, to you know, in, in the humor biz— Beat up all we want on Republicans because they're stupid idiot Republicans and their and their followers are all redneck morons and everything. But at, the, at some point, that ceases to be even remotely creative. I mean, it, that point was reached a long, long time ago. Um, so I think th there was kind of a, a steep decline in the quality of American political humor from which we haven't really recovered. Combined with the fact that a lot of what passes for humor now on both sides is just vicious attacks. Sure. And some of them are very clever and some of them are very funny, but it isn't really that, um, it isn't that funny. It isn't that creative. It's just sort of, I, I'm, I'm going to smear. I'm going to, you know, how many times do you have to be told Donald Trump has weird hair? At some point, you would think this would be exhausted as a source of humor, but it's it's not. You know? do, do you think there's room for a new right wing kind of humor? Maybe not a right kind of right wing that you like, but say now there's alt right. It's at least perceived as new. It's outrageous to many people. I think. Well, uh, no, is I, this the new direction of funny? I know. I don't think. Or I is think, there something intrinsic about humor that it's left wing? There's a left wing. No, slant no, no, to what no, humor no, no. Definitely is. not. I mean, humor should be subversive. And it's a lot. It's a lot more subversive to be right wing than left wing these days. Um, you know, a pro Trump humorist. I don't know if any exist. Would be a lot more subversive than any of the nine. Trump billion. himself is the pro Trump right. humorist. <laughs> In a sense, he's yeah. too funny to make fun of. Yeah, or or just too out there to you know. He's such a, a caricature by himself that he, it's hard to caricature. But but you know, like okay, there's a guy. Uh, are you familiar with the blog Ace of Spades? Yes. The guy's funny. The guy is a funny, funny writer. You know, I don't always agree with him, but he's funny. He's really good. And he's viciously um, anti-left. Yes. And that's rare. And But when you see it, it's like, wow, that's different. You know, I admire the skill that takes to do what he did, what he does. And I don't see it that often. You know, now, Malcolm Gladwell, in one of his podcasts, he criticized the Tina Fey skits of Sarah Palin. Gladwell, of course, 
doesn't like Sarah Palin. And he thought that Tina Fey, even by mocking Sarah Palin, since Tina Fey was a likable person, a likable character, it humanized Sarah Palin for the audience and that the satire was counterproductive. What do you think of that argument? I was just like overthinking it so badly. <laughs> you know, that's not how any normal person reacted to Tina Fey's uh, Sarah Palin, which was brilliant. Um, you know, uh, so no, I'm sorry. That's a, I don't know Malcolm Gladwell and I know he's a brilliant man, but that's way overthinking it. And Alec Baldwin doing Donald Trump. Uh, how funny do you think that is? It's pretty funny, but again, it's like this is a pretty easy target to be taking a swing. I mean, there's a big pinata up there and everybody's got a stick and everybody likes to swing at the Trump pinata. I personally have just kind of gotten to the point where I don't pay that much attention to Trump jokes anymore because they all seem to be the same joke to me. Hey, he's a, look at what he said. Like, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's a moron, you know. Now, some things cross borders fairly easily. A lot of different kinds of foods, so not all kinds of foods. Some, but not all kinds of music. Uh, it's striking to me that humorous movies cross borders less, it seems, from box office data than, say, action movies or even what would appear to be quite culturally specific dramas. What do you think it is about the border that limits the appeal of humor? Probably in part, Engl you know, the English language. I mean, if if... I just speak from personal experience. What little I know of, what, you know, anything I've seen of mine that was translated and what little I understand of the other language, it's extremely difficult to to translate humor and, and have it come off the same way. It's easy to, you know, translate somebody beating the crap out of somebody else. Um, so action movies are going to lend themselves, I think, far better. Now, if it's English to English, um, I think probably American comedies do okay in, in English-speaking countries. I don't know for sure. I know English-speaking comedies from England do pretty well over here. So it Can Canadians on average seem funnier to me. That would be a selection <laughs> Canada, mechanism. Canada is the funniest country in the world. It just hides it much better than... That's correct. But so much British humor, I, I literally feel I don't understand it. There's something about it that, that's very flat to me in the sense that well, the, the, the British the, audience are in New Zealand. They're guffawing. And that word guffaw... I would never use the word guffaw to apply to myself. Well, they don't I might giggle or snort. Out loud a lot of times they just acknowledge the humor of it. That's right. British way. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you have to accept with British humor that no British person has ever in history ever said what he actually thought about anything. Everything that every British person ever says is meant sarcastically. Um, so it's because they're less direct. That they, they are way less direct. Yes, they refuse funny. to ever say anything directly. And that's kind of the wonder of them. Uh, I'm the kind of person, I hardly ever find slapstick funny. Me too. And if I'm I look at old slapstick, it, it doesn't seem funny at all. Intuitively, you would think slapstick, being only physical, would have a much longer half-life. Uh, what I find funny is very culturally specific references. Now, am I strange? Well, not about slapstick. I, I never thought that, I mean, when I was a little guy, I maybe thought the Three Stooges were kind of funny, but that stopped a long time ago. Some physical humor is still funny to me. Abbott and Costello were pretty physical, but they, they were funny without being slapstick. Just punch, you know, hitting each other in the, in the nose and going, yuck, 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 never struck me as, as funny at all. Um, I missed the second part of your. I've forgotten the second part of your question. You mentioned Abbott and Costello. If you're willing, I'll talk about a few comedians or mention a few, and you can tell me what you found funny with them, didn't find funny. Uh, let's start with Abbott and Costello, favorite of my father. I've watched almost all the movies. As a kid, I didn't find them funny, but I actually started to find them funny in retrospect after having watched a bit of Seinfeld and Larry David. What's your take on Abbott and Costello? Yeah, I, I can see the connection there. It, it's, it, it more relies on, on you letting it, the humor slowly develop and the characters themselves uh, being the humor without coming right out and saying what's, what's funny about it. The one who, who, uh, who never understands what's going on, the one who's always uh, losing his patience with the other one. And the first maybe three or four times, it's just mildly amusing. But after a while, you, you, when you, you see it coming, uh, that becomes very funny to you. It's very rare to find that kind of patience and humor anymore. The way they, you know, I don't think the audience is as generous as it used to be, allowing humor to build the way it did in an Abbott and Costello statue. And is Abbott or Costello funnier to you? Abbott being the straight man. Yeah, I think Abbott is funny. I think he's much funnier. Uh, someone who just passed away. I was w watching him on YouTube recently. Uh, Don Rickles. Uh, but it was Don Rickles was a funny man. Um, 
And and I always felt that he was one of the things I liked about him. I saw he was a little out of control, and I know that yes. was contrived. But I think at least early in his career, it was pretty real. You see some of the older performances. He says things sometimes on the old Tonight shows that everybody's just dying, and and then you realize none of them really knows exactly why that was so funny. They just, you know. It was just that he said something that, that nobody would have thought to say. But he says some things that, that we, or at least I, wince at. I mean, could there be a Don Rickles today? He's a kind of equal opportunity insulter, but a lot of it would at least seem to be in bad taste. But since it's applied so liberally, to I mean that word in the multiple sense. Well, it would work anywhere except on a college campus where, of course, you can't say anything at all. <laughs> but I think, I think we have to distinguish between com- com- college campuses and comedy clubs. Comedy clubs, you can still say pretty much. You can be racial. You, can, you know, a lot of comedians still are very racial. And, you know, everybody says, yeah, it's fine. He's, he's kidding. Um, he's not really a racist. He's just, you know. He's he's going on the stereotypes that everybody is aware of, whereas he can't say. But I see non-white comedians being much more uh, deploying racial humor than white comedians. Generally, they can because they can. I because mean, they can. Know, they can. But even I, I don't know. Even white comedians will do it as long as the understanding is, "Hey, I'm kidding. You know, I'm kidding." Which, of course, you can't do on a college campus anymore because nobody's nobody's allowed to kid. Do you think there's anything people don't find funny anymore, even in a comedy club? Campuses aside. Um. If if I saw, I mean, yeah, I I will just speak for my own personal uh, experience as a, as a, a dad of a daughter. If I saw a guy get up and doing you know underage rape jokes, it just wouldn't. And it, even if it were really brilliantly funny, mm-hmm. the only guy who even came close was uh, Louis C.K. did a really edgy joke not too long ago, basically about um, pederasts that you know that came really close to you know. And even then, everybody kind of winced when he did it. But it was it was it was daring and funny. Um, but I myself would would draw a line there. I I, I want to say like the Holocaust, but I've seen people uh, uh, make incredibly funny Holocaust jokes. And yet, again, it all depends on the context, and it all, all depends on your understanding of their sensibility and you know what you're really laughing at. You're not really laughing at the Holocaust. You're laughing at the anxiety or the you know something something around it. But that takes certain skill on the part of the comedian. You know, it's kind of hard to say in general. How about Eddie Murphy? How funny is he? Why well, he used to be really funny. I mean, his stand-up in his, in his day was as good as it got. And his, you know, uh, what was it, Beverly Hills Cop and a couple of movies like yes. that. Where yes. Coming to America is one of my favorites. Yeah. He was really, I don't know what happened. I guess he just got too successful to need to be funny anymore. Or, you know, maybe he just got tired of it. Which I think happens, and you know, God bless him. If you you get tired of it, you don't have to keep doing it. Then that's that's fine. You don't have to. You don't have to live up to my expectation, Eddie Murphy. But he was really funny. Now, one of your favorites, if you could tell us what you find of value in, in him, and that's Robert Benchley. A lot of what he wrote was in the twenties. I was just rereading his essay on New Yorkers versus Midwesterners and who are the true Americans, and I thought it was better than things I might have read last year on the same topic. What is it about Benchley that makes a fair amount of it pretty enduring and influenced you so much? Well, he was radiantly intelligent. Um, he, you know, this, is, this was a very well educated cultured man who made a very good living as a critic um and you know would have would have been able to have a quite successful career as a theater critic or a literary critic he was a he was a smart guy but his, and he was in the movies like you he, yeah. his career well, that, in some ways he, he sort of um he was sorry that he did that in a way he took the money and you know he he he, he regretted i think at least on a he might have regretted more if he didn't do it. Maybe correct? so. Maybe so. And he did make some pretty funny shorts. Yeah. But the other thing, the the reason that I loved him and still love him was that he was that rare uh, comic writer who was willing to be really silly. Um, silliness is an underrated part of humor. Most people, in the end, would rather be cool than silly. And and you know, it's snide and condescending and a lot than just be out there. And being genuinely silly, Robert Benchley was silly. He would take uh, you know extreme left turns in the middle of a uh, of an essay about one thing, and suddenly be an essay about something completely different. He didn't care as long as he thought it was funny. He went for it, and that was the thing that when I was a kid just drew me to him. That he didn't. You know, I was used to being presented with 
Mark Twain as a humorist. Now, Mark Twain is a funny guy and he wrote some funny stuff, but you don't laugh out loud. Well, you maybe do once every in a great while reading Mark Twain. You, you smile and chuckle. Robert eventually made me laugh out loud when I was a kid. Um, and, and I thought that was, that's what I wanted to do. How about jokes in books? So say when I was a kid, I think I was eight, I had a book of jokes and there was one I kept on bringing around to my mother. I read it to her about five times a day. And the punchline was, I'm sick and tired of all this bickering about oatmeal. Now today, if I say that, that sentence to myself in my mind, I still laugh, but I know the joke was never funny or just Jokes listed in books. Is that a joke? Because I missed the... No, that's just only the punchline. The <laughs> joke right. is not funny. <laughs> All right. I missed that one. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. How funny are jokes listed in books? It used to be you could buy these yeah, books all yeah. the time, and now you don't now see you, them much. There's Chuck Losterman. Well, now, as you say, we Sedaris, have... Sedaris is you, but... We have... Now we have Twitter, and now we have the internet. But even before Twitter, it seems those books were disappearing. They were. Is they it are. because they weren't funny? I'm trying to remember the... Li- no, it's just people... People don't have... People don't... Read for well, people don't read books anymore, as far as I can tell. <laughs> but if they, they want humor, they books. look on their phone, you know, whatever mm-hmm. is funny now on their phone, that's what they're looking at. They don't, you know, a printed page with a, with a bunch of jokes on it would seem incredibly archaic to somebody like my daughter. Here's a movie, if you don't know it, will just pass. But Mike Judge is Idiocracy, yeah. I, I never saw the movie, so I do know the principle of it. It's it's a uh, Way in the future, like some professional wrestlers, the president of the United States. And everyone's an idiot. The first half hour is brilliant, I think. At least watch uh, that much of it. When did Mad Magazine stop being funny? And, and why did that happen when it did? I, I don't know if it stopped being funny. I stopped reading it when I started reading like National Lampoon, which struck yeah. me as more, I don't know, a little more grown up. Um, and maybe, maybe I was wrong because Mad Magazine was, some of the old parodies in Mad were just brilliant. It seems it was an influence on you, right? It was. I read a lot of Mad I mean, I read every issue of Mad Magazine when I was, you know, like 10, 11, 12, 13. Um, and I can't honestly say that it stopped being funny. I stopped reading it, so I don't know. But maybe by the mid-80s, it became harder for it to be daring because you have other comedians in mainstream media, well, before the internet, but being more daring, Eddie Murphy would be an example, so Mad didn't seem so outrageous anymore. Do you think that's it? It could be, and then we had, you know, we had a crossover into television, like Saturday Night Live, you know, be, brought the sensibility of my generation to TV, you know, right. the complete willingness to mock everything, mock commercials the way Mad used to, and nobody, but nobody on television mocked television. And suddenly there was, you know, this show that was mocking everything about television. And then uh, the Larry Sand- Shandling show and the thing where, where it became kind of a staple of television to mock television. And Letterman was going to make a whole career out of that. So maybe we didn't need a, a magazine anymore to say, hey, look at the look how silly TV is anymore. So, you know, TV was doing that for us. You've said in one of your essays that you can't really pin down what makes things funny in a consistent sense, that there's something surprising about it. But you think a lot of humor stems from fear and despair. What is it you think that we fear and are despairing of so much? Well, the, the simplest thing is we fear that... Uh, we're going to die. And that before we do, our lives are really pretty meaningless. I mean, they're basically, you know, the world is a completely unfair, uh, ridiculously unfair place. I mean, things keep happening to people that should never happen to anybody. And it seems to be pretty random how they happen. Um, and I think basically the two reactions to that are religion. You know, in other words, there really is a reason for all this and it really is going to end up okay. And if you don't buy that, then there's humor, you know, like, which is to me just a, this kind of weird psychological reaction human beings have developed to tolerate how scary and unfair the world is. I mean, there's no good reason to, to have humor, you know, they, they, no practical reason that I can think of, no evolutionary benefit to it other than it keeps us from going insane. So in your theory, religious people are less funny because religion is their substitute, or they become more skilled at dealing with despair, and so they're more funny? I think they're less funny. So comedians tend to be atheists. I think that's true. I mean, I think that, that this is, and this is not to dismiss religious people. I mean, my dad was a religious person, and he was a funny guy. But that in, generally the two things, one tends to mitigate the other. And to be really edgy funny it's probably better if you don't believe in anything good is coming. <laughs> is this why so many successful comedians have been Jewish in this country? 
Well, that's assuming that Jewish people are more likely to be atheists, which, I which, think atheistic which is probably a pretty regards, good, probably probably a good, good assumption. assumption. That and the, you know, the fact that they're uh, you know, a historically persecuted group that managed to somehow find ways to survive using often their wits. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, that's probably part of why there, why there are so many Jewish comedians. Add that and the fact that everybody, if you're Jewish, everybody you know is funny, like trying to be funny anyway. Mormons it's like revered in that community, that skill, the ability to make people laugh. Mormons historically have been a persecuted community. It could and be they're their, a wacky fun group. Are once they? Once you get no, no, no. But what, why? Did I don't know if there's any Mormon comedians. <laughs> Sarah Silverman. But they came along just for the purpose of, of giving um, who are those guys, the South South Park guys, um, some, yes, something to make fun of, and that's that's that may be their, their divine purpose on earth. They're also two libertarian oriented uh, comics. Yeah, yeah, and we like we libertarians love the Mormons so. But social conservatives as comedians, that's a lot tougher, right? Social conservatives. Yes. Yeah, people who like think um, there should be strict drug laws and... Um, Have a prudish approach to sex. Can't they be funny about something else? You're not going to see that much. No, I don't think so. But our ability to compartmentalize as human beings, just the fact that we could, say, at times find a joke about the Holocaust funny... That suggests we're wonderful compartmentalizers, but the people who are social conservatives, they, they can't compartmentalize? I mean, wh what does that tell us about humor? Well, I think, the, you know, you have to look at the reason they are social conservatives to begin with, and it's probably in, in part because they are religious people, which goes back to my feeling. It's not that it's funny that, you know, the world is set up the way it is. It's because there's a divine plan for it and rules we need to follow. This is not how a humorist thinks. Uh, the humorist thinks, no, there's no divine plan and these rules are stupid. Um, you know, this is, you, you kind of have to be sub, on some level pretty subversive, I think, to be funny. Uh, here, here's a question from Chuck Klosterman from his Cocoa Puffs book. Uh, see what your answer is. Every person you have ever slept with is invited to a banquet where you are the guest of honor. No one will be in attendance except you, the collection of your former lovers, and the catering service. After the meal, you're asked to give a 15-minute speech to the assembly. What do you talk about? <laughs> I would try to seduce the catering service if you know they're, they're being the only people there I haven't already slept. Oh man, um, that would be. I would complain about the catering service. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I would. I think I would have to spend. Uh, boy, first of all, it might be in my case not that huge a group to be to be honest. It'd be it, like I could just address them individually. It wouldn't take that long. But it would include your wife. Yes. Yes, I have slept with my wife. Are there common targets of humor you think are unfairly maligned, other than just the common tendency to attack, say, Republicans or the right, but in, in, at the social level? Um, well, not, not so much anymore. I mean, the, there was a time when the, the almost, you know, half the jokes you heard, and this was in my lifetime, were like Polish jokes, whatever, mm -hmm. and... As we think back, it's kind of stupid. Polish people are not less intelligent. Chopin, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's joke about yeah. Chopin. And and yet that was a staple of humor. And and some of those were pretty funny jokes. You know, you don't hear them anymore. Um, but now, yeah, I think now it's more likely to be a political target. Um, and either which whichever side it is, I'm 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 less I'm inclined to view that kind of humor as as lazier. It's more like I know you're on my team, so if I mock. That person will both get a good laugh, and it also will prove we're smarter than mm -hmm. they are. That's like a kind of the format, the template for a lot of the humor now. And for the most part, it's not really based on anything real. It's like it's kind of silly to pretend that all Republicans are stupider than all Democrats, in my opinion, or or the other way around. It's kind of either way. It's kind of a dumb template to start with, uh, and yet that is sort of the template now, you know, for both sides. One of my readers sent in a question. Uh, would love to hear him talk about sentence structure and its relationship to the effectiveness of written humor. Well, there do you is have any comments on I that? I do. I do. I, I mean, this is my life is is writing sentences that are intended to make people laugh. And you start with the idea of the joke, but then to execute it so that it actually works, it's very similar to what a stand-up comedian does. But he does it with timing and emphasis, and in written humor you do it with spacing and punctuation and, and a few other tricks but yeah the key and this is the most obvious example of why sentence structure is important and yet it is violated all the time in humor writing by amateurs 
is that the funny part has to come last. And then when it comes, it has to end there and go on to something new. And, you know, very often the funniest part of the sentence, if, if it's poorly done, will be in the middle and then there'll be words after. Uh, if you watch a stand up comedian, he'll never deliver a joke where there's more words after the funny part. Right. Uh, but in written humor, that's done a lot by, you know, by people who don't know what they're doing. But so yes, think- sentence structure is really important. And how formally do you think about grammar when you do this? A lot. I, for a long time, well, for, it seemed like a long time at the time, seven, eight years, I taught effective writing seminars to business people. I was young and I looked even younger, but I had to get up in front of engineers, chemists, lawyers, sometimes accountants, people who were accomplished in their fields and, but we're not necessarily good at writing. And I was supposed to talk to them about how to write reports and letters and memos and they, challenged me because I looked like I was 10 years old yes. and who was, and they were expected to be bored also. Uh, so I became a grammar fanatic, um, just in self-defense because I got challenged so often. Why, why do I say it's okay to send end a sentence with a preposition when they were told that you can't do that? Why did I say it was okay to start a sentence with and or but when they were, they were told you can't do, they had all these rules that they right. were told that aren't rules of all of grammar and never were. And, uh, so I became, um, I could, I don't think I can anymore. I could diagram sentences. I, I, I could cite, mm-hmm. you know, usage experts. Uh, so I became very interested in grammar. I was always a pretty good writer, but I, I was a much more aware writer when I came out of that experience. Now, I mean, I use grammar more to mess it up for humorous effect than I do. You know, I don't try to teach anybody grammar, but I, I did, I did find the grounding I got was helpful. Now, you once wrote that after eight years of trying to teach business writing, you became convinced it would never get any better. (laughs) But this is now later. We're in a different time. There's the internet, which actually gets many people writing much more, not not always for the better. But do you think, you know, fast forwarding to 2017, has business writing in any way improved? I'm not as on top of it as I was when I was reading hundreds of letters and memos, you know, every week. But my guess is no. Uh, There are certain (laughs) fundamental things that business people have trouble with. um, And what's the main thing they get wrong from the business mentality? Okay. The, 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 the most consistent mistake, not mistake, but uh, inefficiency of business writing with, and it was very consistent is the absolute refusal on the part of the writer to tell you right away what it is, what the message he or she is trying to deliver. And I used to say to them, the most important thing you have to say should be in the first sentence. And they all, oh, no, you can't. I'm an engineer. We did a 10 year study. This is way too complicated, you know, or, and, and inevitably they were wrong. Inevitably, if they really thought about it, they were able to, in one sentence, summarize why it was really important. But they refused to do that because the way they found out was by spending 10 years of study and all this data and everything. And that's the way they wanted everyone to look at what they did. They wanted their supervisors to go plowing through all they had done to come to this brilliant conclusion that they had come to. Through their history, through their thought drag patterns. The, drag everybody through. And it was the one thing the newspaper people t- were taught to do that, was, that made more sense. You, know, you don't have your reader's attention very long, so get to the point. Um, and I found it was very difficult to get even really smart business people to get to the point. And sometimes it was because they really couldn't tell you what the point was. And what I wanted to say, and but rarely felt comfortable saying, was if you can't tell them, if you don't know what the point is, then you can't really write this, you know, the report. But they, it was always too complicated for a lay person like me to understand. Uh, you know, that was the way they viewed it. But you know, then I was being hired by their bosses to tell them, no, we want you to write clearly, and we want you to get to the point, and we want you to. Uh, and why were they at this meta level resistant to your message? Because nobody else was doing it. I mean, if you, if I got, when I would get, uh, when I would start the class, I have 32 people in the class typically. And when they would turn in all their, you know, sample, samples of writing, every one of them wrote the same way. They all wrote business ease writing, you know, this is my parody of it, but it's enclosed, please find the enclosed enclosure, you know, that kind of, kind of formal, uh, nonsensical, me- meaningless, you know, flow of words somewhere in there would be something important, something significant, you know, or, or maybe not, but. And were the women worse or the men worse? Both sides were equally bad. In and the same ways. Very. Yeah. I did not notice a difference based on gender. I know, you know, I just found very few people 
Yeah, I mean, the very few people are naturally clear, concise writers. That's not a common trait. But but it was more of a thinking issue than it was a, a writing issue. It was just this inability to see the the purpose of the document as anything other than a diary, sort of, to make you see what I did, as opposed to to convey important information to you. Uh, Humor is one area where the enforcement of intellectual property law tends to be weak or maybe even non-existent. So there are always issues or problems with comedians stealing jokes from other people, whether stand-up routines or or in writing. Uh, Do you think it works having an area such as humor where basically IP law isn't applied and there are various conventions and you hope that other people punish those who break the conventions, but you can't rely on that. Or is humor this public good that is actually underproduced because we don't have property rights in jokes? Well, it's not underproduced. There's like (laughs) plenty of it out there. I think it's kind of self-policing. I mean, people do steal. I have had over the years ridiculous experiences, especially when my column was syndicated and, you know, somebody would send me a copy of his local shopper and, the, you know, the local orthodontist wrote, wrote a weekly column. And one week I would look at it and it would be my entire column word for word with his, my name changed to his name, you know. And I'd write or call these people when I was younger and more naive and had more energy. And I'd say, you, you stole my column. You just took it. And they would go... They were never, they were never apologetic. It was like, oh, I meant, you know, I just thought it was so great, you know. I said, yeah, but you <laughs> stole it, you put your name on it, you know. They didn't, like, get that that was wrong. Um, but it, I think it's harder and harder to get away with that. If you are a successful comedian, um, people are going to catch you if you're stealing somebody else's jokes. There's just too much, too many people out there consuming it, you know, seeing it in too many different forms. Who's a comedian who's not so well known, who you think is fantastic and ought to be better known? Written, stand up, television, whatever. That's a, I don't know. I mean, they're, the ones I would name are known. Uh, I'm not that. Um, but even someone like Robert Benchley, while he's on one hand famous, his Wikipedia page is quite long. He's not actually known. Most nobody people knows. haven't heard of him. Nobody knows who Robert Benchley is anymore. This is one of the things um, I've been using for years as an example of why I don't expect to be famous for anything in 20 years except for talk like a pirate day which wasn't even my idea you know but the you know it, the humor people who do humor with so you know the rarest of exceptions do not last in the culture the way people who write um you know tender is the night hang around for much longer like even like we talk about the marx brothers but who goes to see marx brothers movies anymore you know they we know who they are but people still go to see Shakespeare performed, you know, not to compare. But. When there were repertory theaters, I went to see Marx Brothers movies, and Duck Soup, at least, I think, held yeah, up pretty well. Yeah, because you're old pretty like well. me, and they still yes. showed the movies when we were younger. But you don't go see any more of Marx Brothers. Yeah, Duck Soup holds up great. That's the best one, Yes, I think. Yes. But even then, like, there's stretches in Duck Soup where it's just like, <laughs> oh, man, he's just, like really kind of dumb. But it's so dumb, it's kind of funny. Now, your latest book is about Florida, so I thought uh, I would go to news.google.com and just enter uh, Miami, and this is uh, one of the first articles that came back, quote, Miami Beach police say Sigmund Hernandez confessed Wednesday to, quote, slapping and possibly choking his tiny Yorkshire Terrier and leaving her in a public parking garage. The reason, he told police, the dog vomited in his car. I then went to your blog, and there is a story there of... Quote, Zachary Kelly, 30, became upset with Phoebe, a four-month-old puppy who was acting up. They said he held the animal down and bit her on the ears, <laughs> and he was, quote, just trying to teach the dog a teach lesson. Teach the dog a lesson. Now, what is wrong with the dogs in your state? <laughs> the dogs are fine. The people are not. Uh, yeah, my, yeah, Florida. The, the guy who bit the dog, I didn't know, you know— after hearing the expression, man bites dog nine trillion times, I don't think I've ever actually seen an example where a man did bite a dog. <laughs> but if it did, naturally it had happened in Florida. And that dog will not do that again, whatever it was. Why has Florida evolved to become weirder, say, than neighboring states? Well, many reasons. <clears throat> First of all, it's warmer than, well, you know. It's, 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 Is it much warmer than Alabama? Yes, quite a bit warmer okay. than Alabama. Warmer Go, than come, Alabama. Come to Alabama in January, and then you'll want to come to Miami. Um, 
it's warmer. It's it's a much more known as a vacation destination. It's got beaches everywhere. People come there, not not particularly for serious reasons coming there. Um, Doesn't that make them calm though, rather no, than weird? Is it the giant insects that them, make them weird? A lot of them drunk is what it makes them. We have uh, ready access to alcohol and and drugs of every kind in in Florida. We have a lot of uh, a lot of different communities that have absolutely nothing to do with each other living in close proximity. Miami, where I live, is a good example, but. The whole state is it's like 10 different weird little communities. There is no Florida. There's no sense of state pride. Like, you know, people don't go, I'm, I'm a proud Floridian. They just don't. Um, it's, so it's kind of like nobody owns the state, and there are people just constantly showing up in the state uh, for various reasons. I, I would say we're like, we're like the Ellis Island uh, for stupid, weird people. If you, you, know, you want to pleasure yourself into a into a stuffed animal in a Walmart. You're going to go to Florida to do that. You know, you want to get <laughs> naked um, by the side of the road for no apparent reason. Yes, Florida is the place you're like, just nothing else because it's warmer there. And the law enforcement is different. We have, but um, they caught the, this man biting the dog. They caught the man who, you know, kicked the dog through the parking garage. So it's, it's tough on no, law enforcement. No, we eventually do or... arrest people usually, <laughs> but sometimes it's the police officers doing, doing these things. No, we just, I don't know. And you know, it's a, it's a, it's a state where, Every day is a thousand more people than there were the day before. So there's a lot of people that just showed up ready, you know, looking for something um, in, in, the, in the heat and the humidity with the bugs and the lizards and the booze. And it's just a toxic stew of weird is what it is. I was thinking, like, what to me is special about Florida? And one thing that struck me, asking some others as well, is how many wonderful or at least interesting movies are set there. So a simple list would be Body Heat, Spring Breakers. Body Heat was an incredibly good movie. Of course it is, as is Spring Breakers. Key Largo, Contact, Deuce Bigelow, Ace Ventura, Canadian comic, by the way, Some Like It Hot, all kinds of space movies, Uli's Gold, an old movie with Peter Fonda, parts of Midnight Cowboy, uh, all kinds of gangster movies have scenes set in Florida. So why is Florida such a wonderful place to set your movie? Probably because I'm guessing it has something to do with unions <laughs> more than anything else. Um, yeah, it's warm, you know, so you don't have to worry quite as much about the weather down there. Um, and I, yeah, it just it's it has a has a, a an image to it. Florida, it's not people don't think of Florida the way they think of Alabama, even though Alabama's right next door. Um, they think of Florida as more exotic, and they're right; it is more exotic. It's more exotic than any other state, as far as I can tell. And uh, you live near Miami. Let me ask you a question about that place, which I've <clears throat> been to many times. Am I wrong in thinking that maybe 15 years ago, Miami was more culturally central than it is today? Uh, Spanish as a rising language was arguably more important. There was a sense Miami might become or be cemented as a capital of Latin America. It seems now even Latin America in some ways has just turned its back a bit on Miami, not in a hostile way, but... They've developed their, their own urban centers more, media empires outside of Miami more. And uh, it seems to me a slightly forgotten city along with Los Angeles. Art Deco people aren't as interested in anymore. Uh, maybe for the better of Miami. Well, I don't want to get all chauvinistic, but I, I dispute <laughs> you have the same all sense? of those. Okay, tell all us. All of those. No, Miami has grown like crazy. Um, I mean, oh, it's grown, but is it as central to the American consciousness as a rising urban center oh, as I, it was 10, 15 years ago? I think maybe in the sense that everybody's more used to it now, that you know Miami is really the cop, the capital of Latin America. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's it's be any more than New York has become, you know, passe. I mean, it's just cemented that that's what it is. Miami is the center of Latin America, but it's but it's like exploding right now, um, and you know. I, 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 I don't have any statistics to back up this feeling I have, but I don't, I haven't noticed that Miami's turned into some kind of backwater. No. We run our government out of Florida now, right? At least the executive <laughs> branch. <laughs> well, yeah. up, that's up, up the coast a little bit with the rich people, but yeah. But it's not very far. No, no. it isn't uh, in, in linear distance. It's a million trillion miles away in culture. Palm beach and Miami are separated by long, you know, Boca, which is long Island basically. I mean, Miami is, when you get in, across the Dade-Broward line, you are in Latin America. 80% of the city, I think, speaks Engl uh, Spanish as its first language, and a lot of people don't speak any English at all. Um, you can f function comfortably in Miami your entire life and never 
speak a word of English, read a word of English. You just don't need it. Whereas if you are in business in Miami, you don't speak Spanish, you're in big trouble. You're, you're going to need it. So it's still a very, very, very Latin city. But when you get to like Fort Lauderdale and then Boca, you're in New York. You know, Then you get a little farther and you're Palm Beach. You're just in rich person land. Um, I sometimes feel that parts of Puerto Rico are more American than parts of Miami, actually. Oh, definitely. Miami, Miami is not American. It's Latin American. It is uh, Nicaraguans and Colombians and Venezuelans and, and Dominicans. And, and you know, all of these people like the United States, <laughs> but a lot of them are not really assimilated to the United States particularly well yet. And the, the one that everybody talks about is Cubans. My, my wife is Cuban. My, my, my in-laws are Cuban. They are Americans. I mean, they have totally, I mean, they've lost their country and they're okay with that. You know, they are, they're still very Latin, but they're Americans. But the, there are large sections of Miami where people are still living essentially in Colombia or might as well be. And is there to you a central author or cultural figure who represents Florida in some no. way? Absolutely not. The it's closest you would get would be Carl Hyacinth. Yeah, that's who comes to mind. <laughs> and he kind of represents the, I'm really sick of what's happened to my state side of it. You know, he's, he's, Carl does not embrace the changes of Florida. Carl would be happy if it went back to just being mostly snakes and lizards. You have Zora Neale Hurston and also Graham Parsons was from Florida. Even though people think of him as somehow Southwestern, uh, his country sensibility is very much uh, Eastern, actually. You said uh, in, in one of your writings, you've lived in the suburbs of New York City, Philadelphia, and now Miami, maybe other stops in between. Do you think the suburbs are underrated? Yeah, I, I think if, as long as they're, I mean, you know, the, at least where I live in, in, in Coral Gables, which is a city, but it's really a suburb of, of Miami, uh, it's a pretty great place to live. Um, it's, and it's kind of I, what it has in common with the other places I've lived is it has access to um, you know, a major metropolitan area with kind of the excitement and the, and the, the diver- diversity that that implies, but you can be physically more comfortable. Um, and I like that, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think there's a reason like people want to have a yard and a driveway. Um, and I think every, every American should have a right to yard and a driveway. Now, one thing that really struck me going through your life history it's sort of the, the depth and breadth and, and comprehensiveness of what you've done in so many different media. You've written uh, children's books. You've been involved with television. Uh, you've obviously been on the Internet. You wrote a weekly column for many years, uh, business writing, worked with Walt Disney. Uh, there's a rock group called the Rock Bottom Remainders that you were in for a while. Uh, so my sense is there's something quite special about your work habits that is maybe the most remarkable feature about you. So if someone were trying to build a career in some way and they said, well, I want to learn from the work habits or career management of Dave Barry, what has been going on behind the scenes that accounts for your extraordinary productivity defined along a number of different dimensions? Um, well, first of all, thank you. That's, that's the most complimentary thing anyone's ever said about my It's really striking. Work. But anyway... Uh, well, part of it is like insecurity. So I want to keep producing always. always so fear and despair. Fear, fear and despair. Which makes you funny. And, and the constant worry that you, you no longer can do it and that you're not funny anymore. And, you know, so you know, if you, as soon as you start to be just pretty confident that anything you write is great, then you're going to suck um, as a, a, you know, in any creative field, I think. Uh, but then also the uh, certain like uh, impatience uh, or, or um Fear of getting into too much of a rut. Um, so like uh, wanting to try new things that aren't, that you feel like are, you know, in your wheelhouse. Like if I had said that I wanted to become a, uh, a playwright, I, you know, I think I would have been, um, you know, stretching too far. I don't know anything about being a player. I wasn't trained. I haven't studied, whatever. But I, I did feel that if I, I could go from writing, funny essays to maybe trying to write a funny novel if I looked at the funny novel as a series of funny scenes with some kind of plot which is you know crude way of looking at it but at least it was connected in a way that um that I thought maybe it could make it work um so it's kind of a combination of insecurity needing to keep producing and 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 kind of being fear of boredom wanting to do something new that you still felt you could do uh competently 
Or at least not embarrass yourself. What was it like playing music with Roger McGuinn? <laughs> there is sort of embarrassing myself. Um, this has been the, the most fun thing I have done as a grown-up. I'm writing a book now about uh, things I've learned from my, my dog, essentially. And one of the lessons I've learned from my dog is that you, you should not stop trying to have fun even when you get old. And the most fun thing I have done as a grown-up is become – is, is be part of this rock band called the Rock Bottom Remainders, and which is not a good rock band, and I'm not a good musician. What do you play? I guitar? play guitar, yeah. and I did it in college, and I'm good enough that if you didn't know anything, you might think I could play guitar, but if you know anything, you would know immediately that I can't, that I just can fake it reasonably well. But anyway, I got to play with not just Roger McGuinn, but Bruce Springsteen and Warren Zevon, and but Roger plays with us regularly, still does, uh, although it's been a couple of years, i got to admit. Um, and that, that has been the most fun, single fun thing, because it is unlike what I was just talking about, where you want to be in your wheelhouse, you want to be where you can be competent. It's an area where I know I'm not competent. I don't belong. And yet I get to be on the stage with this guy who's really, really great. And what's Roger McGuinn like? What's He's the nicest man. And that's been the thing, the consistent thing with these musicians who have played with. Well, I guess you kind of have to be nice to be a great musician who's willing to play with a bunch of incompetent authors. But Roger is like, I'll never forget like the first time we played, I can't even remember, you know, oh yeah, okay. We were playing somewhere and Roger wanted to stay on stage with us first. He, he had done us. We did a series of bird songs with Roger. And I said, the last thing we're going to do after that is, is La Bamba, uh, but you know, Richie Valens yeah. song. And he goes, Oh, okay. I can I'll, you know, do that. You know? And he goes, what key do you do? And I go, G. And he goes, well, how does that, how does that lick go? And I am to know it. I can play that lick. And I was, it goes like this. And Roger's looking at it. And I'm like, Roger McGuinn. <laughs> <laughs> is looking at my left hand to see how to play a lick on the guitar. And to me, that's like better than winning a Pulitzer Prize. It was really more, much more fun. Now, you have a whole series of books. Peter and the Starcatcher is based on Peter Pan. Many have been bestsellers. Uh, it's believed that more than half of the audience for these books is adults, although superficially they might seem to be children's books. They're that too. Uh, the original novel, Peter Pan, by J.M. Barry. I mean, how do you understand that book? It's a deeply weird book. And what's your sense of that book? And then how you and your co-author, Ridley Pearson, modified Peter Pan? We were really naive. Uh, neither one of us had really spent much time on J.M. Barry. Both of us had been raised in the United States. And our view of the Peter Pan story was the Disney cartoon, the legend, famous Disney cartoon, and Mary Martin on Broadway hanging on wires, you know, this 43-year-old lady swinging around the stage. That was our view of the Peter Pan story. Um, and so, and, and all we were thinking about was that, the American version of the Peter Pan story, the myth, you know, the, you know, which, which is a few simple elements, he can fly, Tinkerbell, Captain Hook, the alligator, I mean, the crocodile, that kind of, you know, the simple elements, how could we put those together in, in a backstory? That would be entertaining for kids. Little did we know we were, you know, sticking a stick into a, a hornet's nest of British people who very take take their jam very very seriously. Like, don't right. like it's Americans. It's like trying to revise Star Wars, right? They don't like Americans anyway, you know, kinds of. So we got we got a you know a certain amount of grief from uh, purists, and you know we we had to from the start say we are not trying to. You know, we don't say we own this story. We're not, we're not saying we're experts on this. We're just here's what we're doing. We're a couple of American guys taking the American view. That was that was our that was our idea, um, and it worked out really well for us. What, one of J M Barry's siblings claimed that J M had never had sex. Now we know <laughs> from one of your earlier answers that's not the case with you. Uh, I never is this had... a dark vision, Peter Pan? Well, I went back and read it, and yeah, it's it's more. I would say more weird than anything else, just kind of a strange story, the way it's told. Um, and I, I honestly can't say I was a huge fan of it. Um, you know, it's hard to, you know, Mary Gateskill wrote recently that it's about how young men are not interesting and women of all sorts are completely replaceable. And you go through life with these relationships and they're all transitory and meaningless and somehow from that comes a book that people are dearly attached to. 
And that to me is strange. It is strange, but I, I've always kind of felt that what they were attached to, because if you listen to people, they don't quote, you know, long passages from Peter Pan. In the end, it's like, when you ask almost anybody, certainly any American, what's Peter Pan about? It's a little boy who never grows old and can fly. All of which is true, but you don't get... But that's a little sick in a way, right? A little boy who never grows old and who can fly? I mean, would you want that life? When I was eight, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in retrospect? <laughs> yeah, no, I could, I could not. It's a kind of punishment. You know, yeah. one of Dante's circles of hell. And not to get all heavy on it, but in our books... We do try to deal with the fact that Peter has to accept that his friends are all going to grow old and leave him, as, as Jan Barry does. I mean, I'm not, you know, that, that is, in a way, the, the, the sad part of it, um, although mostly it's like, isn't it cool that he can fly? But your Peter Pan is more of a Bildungsroman, where Peter develops in a healthy direction. Yeah. So it's like and, more for America. And there's a girl who's, who's really great and strong and nice and, you know, brave. And, and does she really love him? She does, they do, but they can't ever be really in love because he keeps the same age and she keeps getting older. And are you ever tempted to be funny in those books? Yeah. Uh, the, um, there are a couple scenes where, where I go for humor, but the, one of the things I like about writing novels is that you don't have that burden on you. When I write a humor book, it's my feeling is every sentence is supposed to be funny or leading to the next sentence, which will be funny. Um, and with 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 a novel, you're telling a story, which to me is a, you know, a much more kind of relaxed process, less frantic when I'm writing it. Like, what would he say then? And what would he say then? And what would they do then? You know, that would keep you engaged, but it doesn't have to make you laugh, which is a lot of pressure. And to close, could you give us any hint as to what you're planning on doing next? Um, continued immaturity followed by death is my plan. Now, I, I'm, um, I'm writing a book. Uh, it's like I said, it's about dogs. It's about my dog, whose name is Lucy. And it's, it'll be called, I think, Lessons from Lucy. But it was like, I'm going to turn 70 this year, and Lucy's going to turn 70. She's 10. So in dog year 70. And I was thinking about it, when I was thinking about a dog book, and I was thinking, she's still really happy. She is unchanged in, in, in that sense, uh, um, in the happiness that she's changed in her you know, in her appearance and what she can do and everything, but she's still pretty happy all the time. And I'm thinking like, what, did, what does she do that I don't do? Cause I, I can, I'm pretty clear. I'm not as happy as I was when I was 19, you know? Oh, I'm happier than I was 19. Were you really? Yeah. Are you? I think for most men, happiness between 30 and 60 are the peak years. Well, I'm way past that. So I'm on downhill slope. Yeah. So I'm looking to my dog for help. Yeah. And if she doesn't give it, I'm going to bite her. Dave Barry, it's been a pleasure chatting. Same here. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Tyler. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show.